Um, so before I go on, I'd just like to thank the Gene Senator Legacy Fund for helping to sponsor our Learn at Home. We are looking for other sponsors. So if you know anyone that would like to sponsor this, we'd be very grateful. I um, mean, you can always donate at treepeople.org to support um, these Learn at Home offerings. So without further ado, let's uh, get started. We have an incredible um, panel today um, sharing all about native plants and how to grow them and propagate. Um, and so I'll start with our, um, I'm Arielle, I'm the Director of Education and Community at Tree People. Um, and I am the one that's been um, hosting all of these Learn at Homes. And then we have Jack. Hey, hey. Hi, I'm the nursery manager. And I'm joined by our wonderful nursery team, um, part of which is Brenna and Emily. I'll let them introduce themselves. Great, we have Emily. Hello, I'm Emily. Uh, I'm one of the biological science interns here in, uh, at Tree People. Great, and we have Brenna. Hi, I'm Brenna, and I've been a bio -sci intern since December, and one of my favorite native plant species is Calicordis or Mariposa lilies. Oh, I like that fun fact. Jack, <laughs> you want to tell us your favorite native plant? <laughs> Putting me on the spot. Uh, <laughs> go with Toyon, uh, because we just learned how to grow it, and I was really intimidated by it and it was easy. So I love that and it's a great plant. <laughs> great. What about you, Emily? I would have chosen Toy on too, but that's okay. I can have multiple favorites. Uh, I'd probably fair, say- uh, the work on that, so I, and Brenna. Yeah, that, that is true, but it stained my fingers. Um, I'd say probably uh, Artemisia californica. I like that one a lot. It smells very nice. Just this morning, uh, my cat wouldn't, Stop sniffing the shirt I'm currently wearing um, because I think I was surrounded by a bunch of Artemisia. It was, yeah, yeah that, that was the whole thing. <laughs> so cats like Artemisia. Very good to know. That's our first lesson it's today. Fine. <laughs> I, I don't really know any native plant official names, so I apologies, my apologies, but I was hiking the other day and saw this beautiful yucca uh, plant with the white flower on top, and I just loved it. So. Um, you guys can share in the chat your favorite native plants. We would love to know them as we go through this presentation. Um, just as a little admin thing, the chat is the little thing, the little box. It's kind of like a chat box and you just click on it and you can type in there. That's how we'll be communicating today. Um, if you have questions, put them in there. If you have answers to questions that our presenters are asking, just put them in there comments we love comments questions we love interaction but we're going to keep our um, mics off and our cameras off and just use the chat for communication oh and i see some hummingbird sage milkweed coming in on the favorite native plants monkey flower <laughs> seeing some happy nods for Brenna. <laughs> all right let's get started next slide so this um, presentation is really about seed gathering basics and propagation tips to grow your native garden. And we'll get started with Jack. Yeah, um, we're gonna get back to some of those that slide, but here, um, so what you need to get started, first of all, um, collecting plants and seeds is one of my favorite things to do. All you need to do to get started is just have um, a writing utensil. I prefer sharp because they won't rip your bag and as I just insinuated, you need bags to, because these little seeds are tiny, um, some, and you don't want to have them just in your pocket or something like that. And we'll go into the type of bags depending on the species you need. But that's really all you need: bags and, and something to write, and um, I guess shoes to go outside and you know walk around and collect these plants. So on the left, um, that is our senior arborist, Brian Record, and I. Um, I guarantee you he's not wearing uh, shoes in that picture. He's wearing sandals. Um, we're out. So the biggest question, the first question is obviously access to these plants because not everyone has access to a mountain range in their backyard or, um, you know, an open space in their neighborhood that may have native plants. But um, so here on the left, we have the cork oak, which is where, um, for those of you who enjoy some vino, that's where we get the corks for that. And, and um, this one was just next to a bus stop. We were getting a truck 
hopped on and Brian came down at this huge pile of acorns. Because we're both plant nerds, um, we had some bags ready to go. And instead of let these little acorns just become just trampled or, you know, washed away, we decided to grow a little forest with them. And side note, those ones are not native, um, but orc, oaks are still a great tree, uh, especially for a lot of places in our landscape. Um, and if you want a cork oak, let me know. I still am trying to get the last four or five of these adopted. No questions asked, just take them, please, and put them in the ground somewhere. Um, so on the right, you'll see this beautiful coast live oak, Quercus agrifolia. Um, this one probably comes in a close second for my favorite plant. As you can see, this one is huge. I'm giving it a big hug. It's uh, one of its sisters had fallen into the creek just off camera there, so giving it some comfort. And in this one, we are in a wild space. So on the left, you wouldn't need a permit to collect those acorns. They're in the public domain and they're everyone. And you're actually doing those landscapers a favor by collecting them. Um, on the right, you would need a permit for that because that is on a preserve and the acorns that fall there um, are intended for wildlife only. If I wanted some acorns, the one on the right, I would do just the only amount that I need, no more than 10%. Um, pop quiz question, how many um, acorns do you think a coastive oak would make per pulse? And I say pulse, and Emily will get into this a little bit later, but um, don't make acorns every single year necessarily. So yeah, just curious what you think on that. But uh, we can go to the next slide. Yeah, and you guys can use the chat to answer Jack's question. I mean, I don't know, Jack, like hmm. 20, 50? <laughs> any, other, any, any others have guesses for how many? That would be the amount I would want to collect, but they can make, <laughs> they can make thousands per pulse. And if you know uh, anyone who has an oak tree, a mature one, they'll tell you that they are happy to donate their acorns because they don't, they can't have forest growing on their yard have a couple of oaks because they get to be so big so that's something else to consider when you're collecting are you trying to grow just for you know look at how big the parents got and consider that when making your decisions uh, so we have our um coast live oak acorns love the way they look the little pinstripe um is one of the characteristics of that species you also notice that has a cap on it when you're um, collecting the coast live oak acorns, or any acorns really, you're gonna need to remove that uh, before you propagate them. And uh, we're gonna go into how to propagate them in a little bit. But um, for collection purposes, paper bag is totally fine. Um, and then you would need to put them in a plastic bag later on. Um, so we have a bunch of different animal or plant life in uh, California. And some of them are perennials, of course, some of them are annuals. So, um, the perennials, of course, live for multiple years. Annuals, as the name suggests, they only need one year to complete their life cycle and they complete their mission and then they're done. Um, on the right is some uh, arroyo lupins that I was collecting near the LA River where we have a permit, but some of them were also just falling on the trail, falling into the river. And so for those, I think it would be totally fine for people to take a couple of these pods here. These look like a uh, little like edamame or like peas or something. I love when the seeds are really obvious like that. Some of our species are tiny and you don't really know what to look for. Um, but um, great purple flowers, it's a great big annual. Pollinators love them. Um, one question I have for the group would be, why would some plants evolve to be annuals instead of annuals? Just curious what your thoughts are on that. Um, and we're ready for the next slide, please. Hey, Jack, right, we so have a um, oh, yeah. question. Why, why the need to transfer from paper bag to a plastic bag? Right. So a lot of times um, there's some logistics in the field where paper bags are usually more convenient. Um, sometimes you don't know what you're going to get. And some things, if you, I'm um, actually, it's going to come up in a, in a slide coming up soon, some things, if you put them into a plastic bag, while they're still fresh, they could start to rot a little bit if you can't process them right away. Some stuff they need to dry out um, in order to be preserved. 
other things like a coast live oak acorn, the one that we were just looking at, if you left that in a paper bag for too long, um, you it be viable to grow anymore. You're essentially it like you would for food. Uh, speaking of which, we are dealing with plants that are um, have been here for millions of years. Uh, when we're talking about native plants, we're talking about plants that have been here uh, before colonial or before contact with Europeans. And um, in in our situation, we are on Tongva land, and we also operate uh, and live on Chumash and Tataviam land. But um, for our poppies here, and I'm I'm going to answer your question further, actually, right now because it's I'm perfect timing for that. Um, do you see in here? This is a type of poppy, um, and this is another access issue where there's going to be construction on this state where I'm. We're looking at this poppy um, and so a friend and I went to go see if the seeds were ready you can tell that this little green bean looking thing and that loop um, is like three dollars from Rite Aid so again you don't need to spend hardly anything to do this stuff um, but it'll help it helps you identify tiny things anyway that green bean is almost ready about 30, 40 seeds in there so knowing how where they are hope you can collect them before um, these bulldozers come in and do a sediment removal. Uh, on the right, it um, shows you what part of the seed bank looks like. So all the seeds in here are very happy with dry storage. Um, some some areas, if you have the resources, then yeah, if you can put them in a refrigerator, then great. Um, it's not necessary for everything. And even storing them isn't necessary for everything either, which I'm gonna cover soon. Um, did I answer that question thoroughly enough? Yep. Thank you, Jack. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, we're, unless there's any other questions, uh, seed storage at the moment, we can come back to it later. Uh, I still want to eat up too much time um, before yep. the Q&A. I'm ready. For yeah, that. we'll keep the, the questions to the end now. Thank you, Jack. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And I'm ready for the next slide when you are. Sorry, I had I started having fun with my transitions. So here we are. Um, when we're planting in the landscape, um, a lot of times I'm not exactly sure either what to plant in a yard. Um, unlike what did we just lose, Jack? Sorry, everybody. We're having a little technical difficulty. Um, we'll get on it right away. Okay, we'll give it one more second. If we can't get him back, maybe we'll skip to your part Brenna and then come back to Jack. Um, so why don't why don't we go ahead and do that Brenna? Let's let's go and skip to your your presentation and then we'll get back to Jack. Thank you everybody for being patient. All right. Hello there. Now it's time to talk about grass, especially Stipa coronata. So Stipa coronata, aka crested needle grass or giant Stipa, is uh, the scientific name is derived from the Greek word stupeon, which part of my pronunciation, um, meaning fiber and cordage, and coronata is Latin for. And it loves to grow on coastal and inland hills, often chaparral plant communities. And um, it, chaparral is the name for um, a lot of the uh, ecosystems that are in uh, Southern California. In the, on the hillsides, drier areas, um, and yeah, Stipa coronata mainly grows in Southern California um, and a little bit in the east of the state, um, just here and there. And uh, 
It prefers rocky, sandy, or gravelly soil and full sun. It needs very low moisture, so it's a very um, hardy plant and doesn't take a lot of uh, special care. Um, and it's also a likely host plant for the common ringlet butterfly, juba skippers. And a skipper is, uh, if you're not familiar, it's like smaller than a butterfly. It kind of looks like a cross between a moth and a butterfly, and they're very fast. Um, Nevada skippers and uncas skippers. And um, yeah, so they attract pollinators, which is awesome. Why should we propagate native grasses? Let us know in the chat why you think this is important. Well, I'm going to tell you why <laughs> also. <laughs> because grasslands are more efficient carbon sinks than forests. Whoa. Did you know this? I didn't know this until very recently, and it's really an awesome revelation. Um, so yeah, what's a carbon sink, you might be asking. Uh, I'll break it down for you. We have a little infographic here. Um, carbon sinks are natural systems that absorb carbon dioxide through the, from the atmosphere through photosynthesis, turning it into carbon and storing it, with the three largest natural sinks being plants, oceans, and soil. And why do we want to store or sequester carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide? <laughs> um, because it's the greenhouse gas that contributes the most to climate change, negatively affecting human health, air quality, and the health of our planet as a whole. Um, so now let's get back to why grasses in relation to this. So. Grass, gr <laughs> grasses are more efficient than trees when it comes to sequestering carbon because they store it underground in their root systems, whereas trees mainly store carbon in their leaves and uh, woody biomass. So if grass is, say, eaten by sheep, as we see in this uh, illustration, or mowed down or burned by a fire or di dies from drought, which would be rare because these uh, gra native grasses are very drought tolerant. Um, the carbon that they have stored in their roots will remain stored in the soil. Unlike trees, which are not very drought tolerant and very vulnerable to fires, and when they die and start to decay, or are burned in a fire, that carbon is then released back into the atmosphere. So you can see why now that grasses are more efficient carbon sinks. Awesome. All right, and also let me know if you have any questions about that and I will address some later in the Q&A. Oops, <laughs> okay, so yes. Um, now it's time to sow some grass seeds. So here are some pretty like basic uh, ingredients to the grass sowing process. Um, on your left, we have some zip sets, which we order online in bulk, but if you don't wanna do that and you wanna go the super repurposed cheap route, you can always use a plant-based milk carton. Um, a lot of them are kind of rectangular, so you would cut the top and bottom off of those, and then you'd be good to go. Um, next, you want to get a repurposed milk crate that you can usually find behind a grocery store, and they'll probably let you have it for free. And that's going to help you store your potted grasses in a nice, upright, Tetris-like way. Um, and next you want to have a gardening tool, a handheld gardening tool with a long handle to help you tamp down the soil. Oops, there's a fly. <laughs> um, tamp down the soil in your carton to make sure it's really dense um, at the bottom and won't fall out. Um, and of course, very important, your soil, which uh, we use a 
um, concoction of perlite, peat moss, and sand, which you can all purchase separately. And so let's talk about that soil. Um, if you aren't able to find a premix soil that contains perlite, peat moss, and sand, you can always make your own. And you can see on the left here, we have our Team Angelus mixing some soil in the Tree People Nursery. Um, so you're gonna wanna grab an empty wheelbarrow or a large storage container, a large shovel, a small hand shovel, uh, an N95 mask, and that is um, because the perlite is a very uh, toxic, uh, well, not toxic, it's basically small particles of glass. So you would not want to inhale that. And it's very dusty whenever you're scooping it. Um, and goggles, of course, to protect those eyes from the perlite. And also uh, one to two family members or housemates. Ideally, this is a three person job, but if, you, if there's only two of you, you can um, scoop and mix and then water after the fact. Um, once you're done uh, adding the ingredients. So what is the ingredient ratio? Um, you're gonna wanna add four large scoops of peat moss, four large scoops of perlite, then two hand shovel scoops of sand, and repeat this for one to four rounds depending on how much soil you need for your project. Um, and so, yeah, we can watch this video one more time. While one person is adding the ingredients, you see Alyssa doing that there with the peat moss. Uh, another person is mixing, which Thierry is doing, and then, or Matt's doing, and then Thierry is watering while um, all that is going on. So now we're going to start potting up. So grab those clean, empty plant-based milk cartons with the top and bottom removed and start to fill in the soil. Next, uh, once you have a little bit in there, use that long handle tool to periodically tamp down the soil and, until it becomes easier to just do so with your hand. Um, and the further up you go, the less compacted it needs to be. Um, and like I mentioned before, the reason we want it compacted is so it doesn't fall out the bottom of your milk carton. And also good to note that um, the reason why we use zip sets and indoor milk cartons is because that will give the plant enough room for its long root systems to grow down. Um, grasses, yeah, like, like I mentioned, they have great root systems. Um, so yeah, next step. Um, <clears throat> Make sure to leave an inch of room at the top of your carton to allow space for water to be contained and not overflow, um, which could result in soil loss or erosion around the root base. So, and you're gonna be watering these quite a bit. Um, now it's time to sow your grass. And um, I, I think I did leave it on in that demo but ideally you would want to remove the on from the seed and the on is the little tail um that's attached to the seed and the seed itself is just about the size of a grain of uh rice um so remove the on and you're gonna take one to two seeds or you could even do four spaced out if you're using a sort of wider rectangular milk carton um and you just need to press that seed right on top of the soil and this is to recreate what happens in nature um so you know a lot of times with others uh with seeds you might be more familiar with planting you put them under the soil and um but in this case, no need to bury it um, because in the wild, it would just be distributed by wind or um, other pollinators that might have the seed attached to it, or maybe it would um, be released in their scat. Um, yeah. So 
How long do you think it will take your seed to germinate or sprout? Give a guess in the chat. <laughs> so if you guess one to three weeks, you're correct. <laughs> Super Coronata takes about one to three weeks to germinate with regular watering and prefers a warm human environment, which um, obviously not everyone has a greenhouse. We do in the nursery because, uh, you know, that makes sense. But <laughs> um, you can recreate a greenhouse environment by taking a large clear plastic bag and placing that over your milk crate, um, kind of like a, a cloud resting on top of it. Cut a few holes in there and that's gonna give you that humidity and extra warmth that will help germinate. And on the left, you can see kind of like directly the relation between the seed and uh, the germinated or sprouted grass. And then on the right is, um, yeah, that was take, both photos are from our greenhouse that, and these are Sipa Coronatas that were um, planted a few weeks ago. And yeah, so once your plants are between six to 12 inches, you can then plant them in the ground using the tree people planting method used during our restoration events. And if you, um, if you have joined us for our restoration events, um, or sorry, <laughs> if you have not joined us for our restoration events or you have and you need a little refresher on the planting process, we can share a step-by-step -step guide with you um, at the end of this presentation. So um, that I believe, yeah, that does it for me on grasses. And so should I uh, shoot yeah, back? So let's try to go back to Jack's slides. Okay. Um, sorry, Brenna, you have to <laughs> do the That's okay. PowerPoint. Jack, are you with us? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Sorry about that. My roommate had trouble too. I don't know what was going on, but um, I will uh, try to go faster before it happens. It sounds much better now. I'll <laughs> okay, let you good. know if an issue. Thank you, guys. All right, cool. Well, I'm almost done, actually. So what we're just saying is that um, sometimes we just have to guess on what's going to work, and uh, that's okay to not to not be able to predict the future. These these plants have been missing from these landscapes for a long time, and um, you know, we just have to figure out what we'll do best. So, prepared for a little bit of failure, and um, sometimes uh, failure can mean way too much success because sometimes we'll sow things and get 500 of them, and we can't that many concentrated in that area. Uh, I'm ready for next. So, uh, this one I've had luck through the yard. This is Artemisia californica. Um, uh, we love this plant. Here's an example of uh, these were from a another development site and um, um, just going to bulldoze this area and put homes there. So fortunately, one of our volunteers, Ryan, he collected some seed before he, that happened. And um, we were able to uh, propagate seed in a paper bag, but he didn't have one available. So we got in a paper bag right after selling them. And then Barbara, thank you so much. Um, at the plant puppies for um, taking these um, timeline shoots for us, super helpful. Um, and um, we can show you in the next slide, what they look like now. And there we go. Um, you on the ground, they're in the zip sets that Brenna was just talking about. And um, you know, uh, that's a picture of me from Halloween. It's a lot of fun to grow and plant stuff. And this one was uh, captured by one of our um, uh, eco tours, uh, our wonderful Rosa Dunis um, got this picture of me. I'm ready for the next slide. Another really great one. Um, and I tried to cover, it's, it's like a little weird. Okay. I'm covering plants that would do well pretty much anywhere in the Los Angeles basin. So um, this is another one. Purple sage does really well from seed. Um, I have a black sage seed here for my yard. I should have added this part. Basically, you just grab this. Um, this in once all these flowers fall off and it dries a little bit, and you just roll it 
in your hand or above a bowl or something smells amazing um, and then you can either eat them or you can direct sow them in the yard bag them up share them with a friend um, or you can try a a really great diy uh, greenhouse method that wouldn't take up a lot of space in your yard um, Barbara, for example, has a greenhouse like window. And so there's a lot of different ways you can propagate these things. I'm ready for next. Here's another one. At, um, this one gets a little bit of a bad reputation, but people really love non-native hedges and other things to give them privacy. I really love this one on the, this is a dioecious plant. So it means it has male, uh, uh, male plants, uh, male flowers rather, on one plant and female on the other. Um, can you guess which one of these two is the male and which one is the female on the picture on the left? And then again, photo creds to Barbara um, for providing these timeline. We were also very pleasantly surprised these grew. Um, good guesses. So actually, um, the, the way I was taught was she has a long white dress and uh, he has a frilly shirt. So the male flowers, like with um, some birds, other actually, like the females can be lar often larger. Um, yeah, the flowers on the Bacchus pilaris uh, are larger. And also really obvious, really easy to grow. It's evergreen, super tough, um, beyond drought tolerant. You, I see people mow these down and they come back all the time. They're just indestructible, wonderful plants. And um, who, want, who doesn't want a daisy bush in their yard, right? It's, we don't even know exactly how many pollinators depend on this, but it's dozens. It's probably close to 60, but a lot of this, a lot of these little animals are tiny, so you to count each uh, species interaction is tough. I'm ready for next slide. Here's a little example with my own yard. When I first moved to Highland Park six years ago, I was on board with drought tolerant because that was what was moving. That's where the messaging really was, but um, it wasn't there yet with native plants, which is really more important because you get the benefits of the drought tolerant um, plants while also providing more habitat, shade, potentially food and medicinal values. So this is my yard. Uh, the landlord said I could do whatever I want. And as you can see in the backyard, it, he didn't know what he was talking about. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, I put a bunch of oaks here. Don't tell him. Anyway, um, yeah, so there's all my succulents that I had when I first moved in. I ripped all that stuff out since this is my yard on the right as of today. And I wanted to highlight before I wrap up, uh, one of the easiest plants to grow in Los Angeles is mule fat. I'm gonna cover that in a second. On the, four, on the right, that's a stipopulchra, one of the cousins of, um, I was just talking about, uh, also very easy to grow and propagate. Um, so yeah, we can go to the next slide, please. Oops, oh, there we go. Okay, oh, sorry. <laughs> it's all right. Uh, meal fat steaks, super easy. I have one right behind me by the bird bath. Um, they can tolerate, I mean, most of all of my plants are off irrigation, but for some people who really love watering plants just because it's fun or therapeutic in some way, you know, these plants can tolerate too much water and also not enough, depending on where you are. You might need to give them a little bit to get them started, but um, I just cut. Uh, about a foot length or maybe six inch length. And then you have to have the woodier um, part of the plant. And as you can see, I did it as that's to, because um, when you're driving it into the ground, it's going to need, it's going to clone itself and make new roots. You don't, you want it to focus on making roots first and not on trying to save the leaves that you leave on the stick or the stake rather. And the only other thing that may not be obvious about this picture is that I'm soaking it in about two inches of water overnight. So I put it in the caption there. Um, but yeah, another really great one. You can great for uh, some guerrilla gardening and um, you just soak it overnight, take it with you on a run. And then on those empty lots in LA where there's just garbage plants going on, you just drive them in the ground, get them as deep as you can. Ideally before it rains, uh, like with all these broadcasting, I do it before it rains or in some things like the lupins, they need summer dormancy. They need the heat. So just toss them in the ground and be patient. Um, Again, going back to access on the right, that's the type of pulchra. Um, the parents of those seeds were weed waxed the very next week. Fortunately, I was able to collect these before they do. And uh, it's a great activity it's processing seeds during your Zoom meetings. It's a great way to um, stay productive 
uh, you know, fight species extinction, fight climate change, and um, also, uh, you know, it, it's just a lot of fun. You just got to be careful, though, because I walk around barefoot, and these are purple needle grasses are appropriately named. Every once in a while, I'll catch one on the, in my, my foot. It's kind of like stepping on a Lego. It's not much fun. So um, with that, um, that would have transitioned to Brenna, but I think now we're ready for Emily. Yes, great. Thank you, Jack. All right, so we'll go to you, Emily. Um, I muted you, so if you could unmute yourself, Emily. Um, but you're still muted, Emily. I had to mute you, sorry about that. Um, okay, she's gonna figure it out. Oh, she's gonna come back. <laughs> sorry, everybody, thank you for dealing with our technical difficulties. Um, while we're waiting for Emily, how about we answer a few questions? Um, there were quite a few questions in the chat. One thing I saw was yeah. folks wondering, oh, she's back. Okay, go ahead, Emily. Okay. Oh, sweet. Thanks. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, instead of questions, we're going to talk about oak trees. Yay. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about specifically the Quercus agrifolia or the coast live oak, um, mostly because I am from the Bay Area originally, from Oakland. Um, and those grow, so these coast live oaks will grow both in Northern California and Southern California. And in terms of Southern California, you can find them all over the place. They are super important for both the chaparral and the oak woodland communities. And so these two pictures are kind of representing that. And what's very cool about the coast live oak is just how variable it can be in its growth pattern and size. So on top, you can see this is a chaparral community here. And it's, you know, it's fairly tall, but that's because it's growing right into what looks like some sandstone. Versus on the bottom picture here, this is much more oak woodland. And you can see just how much taller the tree is. Um, and also that's partially because one, it's not growing into pure stone. And then also just off camera, there's like a little creek going there. And why that's important is all of the undergrowth in this bottom picture, all these like snow berries and such, really like the shade that's provided by the oak tree. So you can see that the coast live oak is just hugely important for a lot of different communities. And also just some fun facts, they can live over 250 years old and they can get from 30 to 75 feet, which is pretty darn big. Uh, next slide, please. So Jack gave a lot of great information about how to grow these or how to collect these in the first place. So yes, do like get a whole bunch of them off the pavement if you can. Also, plenty of homeowners will probably thank you if you collect their acorns for them by like asking first. Um, what you're gonna find is that they're not going to produce every year. This is something that Jack started talking about. And the reason for that is there's a little bit of scientific debate as to why they have these pulses not every year. Um, but the thing that we're thinking about most is that it may deter predators. So if you think about it as the oak tree is producing a consistent amount of acorns every year, all the squirrels and everybody who comes to eat, to, to eat the acorns might just be like, oh, this is a consistent snack. I'm always going to show up here. Versus if they have a bit of a pause of a year or multiple years in between dropping those acorns, maybe all the squirrels will look somewhere else. So that gives all those acorns that fell, hopefully a greater chance of surviving. So for you, basically that means if there aren't acorns falling in your neighborhood, don't worry about it. Even just another street over, you might find a whole bunch of acorns. Um, so when you're collecting them, you don't wanna get any that are really discolored, like if they're really dark. You can see in this lovely photo on top, that's what they should be looking like. If it's really dark black, it's not gonna be good. Also, if it's very small, if it's like really shrunken in size, that's probably not gonna be viable. Uh, you'll notice a lot of tiny little weevil holes. Those ones, something's been eating them, so those ones aren't gonna be good. And also, if there's just a big chomp out of it, like a squirrel did something, that one's not gonna be good. Oh, next slide, please. Awesome. So. 
the acorn processing uh, process is somewhat involved. Um, also, by the way, this method can work for things like the bay laurel, those bay nuts. It can also work for the local California walnut. So anything that has kind of a large nut like this, you can do the same uh, soaking process I'm going to be talking about. So first thing, once you get them in your paper bag, first of all, you're going to first kind of sort through them to make sure you didn't get any like bad ones and throw those ones out. And then also rinse off any dirt. And the reason for that is we're about to put them into a bleach solution. And when bleach comes into contact with soil, it is no longer active. So kind of get rid of as much dirt as you can beforehand. And then we're going to soak them in a 10% bleach solution. So that means for one gallon of water, you'll have 13 ounces of bleach in there. And the reason we put this in a bleach solution is it's going to be solving two, purpose, uh, two functions. Um, one is the float test that I'll talk about, but also in general, this leak solution is going to kill any gross dust that might be on the ground. For everybody who knows about the Phytophthora species that has been ravaging the country, um, that's one of the ways that we can try and help prevent spreading that somewhere else. Um, really just a lot of various pathogens. It's a good idea to try and do your best to get rid of those before you grow these anywhere else. Um, and then also, when you soak these in the water, after about a minute, you're going to notice that some are going to sink, and then other ones are going to float, as you see, hopefully presented well enough in that picture on top. Um, the ones that float are not going to be viable. So those ones, as Jack said, uh, the duds can go back to nature. Um, the ones that sink, however, those ones are going to be viable, or at least have the best chance. So those ones, you're going to scoop out, wear gloves when you're handling your dilute bleach solution. You can scoop those out, put those into a freezer bag, like what is shown on the bottom picture here. And then you're going to add a little bit of slightly damp soil, like the kind of mix that Brenda was talking about. Um, you want to make sure that this soil isn't soggy at all. Um, and then also, once you've mixed up your acorns with the soil, you're going to add some air holes on one side. You're going to poke a bunch of air holes. And the reason for that is you want to make sure it isn't too soggy because then you can have a lot of issues with like mold and mildew coming up, which we don't want, especially if we just did all that work bleaching them so that they didn't have any pathogens. We don't want to like have mold come up on them. Um, and so once you have this prepared, you're also going to put the date you actually did this test um, all the information you usually have when you collect these, the date collected, where you got them. And then you're going to put these into the fridge. And the reason you put them into the fridge is this is called cold, this is called cold stratification. This is basically simulating winter for them. Uh, so that means they're going to be in a kind of damp and they're going to be kind of cold. Um, and so during this winter simulation, this is when they can start to push out the radicals. And uh, next slide, please. Oh, I think, yeah, yeah, that is right. Um, so after about one to three weeks, you're going to notice that they're going to start to push out their little roots, and that means that they can be planted. And so you may notice at this point that uh, you might have too many acorns, and you're not willing to plant all of these acorns into pots. And if that's the case, don't worry about it. You can direct sow a lot of these. So if you want to direct sow them, basically find a spot. You're going to dig. Really, you don't even need to dig a hole. You just need to loosen the ground enough that you can fit uh, an acorn and then put about three inches of soil on top of it. And usually to try and get one tree to come up, you can put like two or three acorns in there. Um, now, the reason that we put so much soil on top of these ones is because it should hopefully keep the squirrels out. I mean, this is kind of mimicking the fact that squirrels will often bury acorns and then forget about them, and that's how you get oak trees. So we're kind of kind of simulate that a little bit. Uh, next slide, please. For if you want to pot up your acorns, um, you can use the same soil mix, same kind of pot and everything that Brenna was talking about. Um, now, the angle at which you plant your acorns is important here. The back end, the one that the acorn cap was on, is going to be sticking into the air 
and then the pointy end, the end that the radical is coming out of, is going to go into the soil. And as you saw there in that video of uh, my hands planting one, they're going to go in at about a 45 degree angle. It kind of looks like it's launched itself into the ground a little bit. So that's very important. Um, and once you got that, next your goal is to protect your seedlings because uh, squirrels are evil and they will destroy your lovely plants. Um, okay, they're not evil, but um, first of all, like when, it's, when they're in the acorn form, that totally makes sense. They're supposed to eat those, but squirrels will actually come after a young oak tree for about its first year of life. So even when there isn't an acorn anymore, they will just bite the very base of the plant and just kill them. So that's the worst thing ever. So learn it now rather than when they wipe out your whole batch of acorns. Um, ways that you can prevent this, obviously the way that we do it in the nursery is we have a big physical barrier. So that's a picture of our tree people nursery. You can see that we have just a very large mesh cage that we're inside of. So that's gonna keep any kind of creature from getting in. Um, for your home setting, you can do a miniature version of this. If you get some like chicken wire or something and put it around a frame and then put it over your trees, you can do that. There's no such thing as over-engineering when it comes to squirrel prevention. So you might make something really tough and then squirrels knock it over. Um, make sure that it's, it's a, a very tough cage you put around it. Um, other possible strategies that I've seen thrown around before are ways to throw squirrels off the scent of the acorn. So apparently people growing like a, a nut based trees will plant garlic next to them because apparently the or garlic or like onions because apparently the smell can throw them off. Um, there's also been research talking about how native shrubs like the purple sage or the California sagebrush um, those with like a very strong smell, if you plant oak trees next to them, they'll be less likely to be eaten. And I guess the theory is that it's that the smell is throwing them off. Um, yeah, so go ahead and experiment with that. Uh, next slide, please. And then, yeah, after a couple of months, as you can see some of those little uh, potted, potted oak trees that we showed you, they grow they grow up so fast, it's really satisfying to watch an acorn grow. And mostly plant your tree sooner, sooner rather than later. Um, a lot of people want to have their trees be really, really big before you put them in the ground. And that's like an understandable reasoning. But really when it comes to the long-term health of the tree, if you plant them in the ground once they're maybe a year up to a year old or even younger than that, um, they're going to do much better. And the reason for that is these oak trees are going to make a very successful taproot. And at a certain point, once the taproot hits the bottom of the pot, it's just going to be winding around and it has no place to go. Um, and it's just really not going to be happy with that. So if you get them into the ground and protect them with your gopher cages and your deer cages, or you put them next to some kind of nice smelling native plant, um, if you get them to go and then also make sure you're watering them, they're going to do much better than if you wait and pot them up into like a five gallon and then wait for like a couple of years before putting them in. They're just going to do much better if they're just into the ground as soon as possible. All right. And that, uh, that's about all I have here. I see some questions, but we'll uh, probably yeah. do those all during the question section. Some great questions. Um, well, thank you guys, first of all. That was a great presentation. Really appreciate all of your knowledge. Um, so let's go to the questions. I have them all here in front of me. And I know, Jack, you were responding to some of them, but I'll repeat them just in case there are folks that couldn't see the chat. Um, and then we're also recording this so folks can see it uh, via the video as well. Um, and Bren, I did have to mute you. So just FYI, if you want to unmute. Um, so the first question was, is there any alternative to peat moss? Um, I've read it's a non-renewable non resource. Sure, I can take that one. Um, so that has been brought to our attention and we try to do everything as ethically as possible. Um, said, we also, we, 
<laughs> we had to kind of reinvent the wheel on so many things because of the nursery practices that we're doing. Um, the first thing being that we are the second um, native plant nursery in Los Angeles to be uh, for a compliant. So we really had to focus on that in order to get our plants in the ground and then address the sustainability issue later. One thing that we have now been able to phase out is vermiculite. Um, for those who are unfamiliar, vermiculite has the potential to be a carcinogen because it has a natural source of asbestos in it. That's part of the reason when uh, COVID came down, the nursery was already prepared because we had to do all these all this cleaning stuff. We had to have these masks, isopropyl alcohol, bleach, all the wipes, we had all that already because of our practices. But um, to go back to your question though, I wanna phase out perlite and peat moss eventually. We are um, eagerly looking for alternatives that could meet the same volume at the same price range. Um, the cocoa husks that we tried didn't get us to the same volume that um, we need to reach for our project goals for our deliverables. So if you have suggestions, um, I'm all ears. Right now would be a really good time for that too because I just went to Lowe's yesterday and they were out of peat moss. Um, so yeah, welcome any yeah. of your suggestions. Great, so if we, yeah, let us know if you have any suggestions on that. Um, but we do large volume soil, so there, those other alternatives Jack mentioned probably would work if you were just doing a backyard. Um, all right, if you don't have the equipment or people to make your own soil, can you buy mixed soil at a nursery? And do they have different kinds for grasses or natives? Yes, they do. Um, oh, there's one in Chino, I forget. But um, to answer your question, yes, it takes a little bit of research. This is a specialized kind of a niche um, market, but especially with everyone being in stay at home, um, there has been a revival in a big, with the growing at home community. So just try to find something as, as close to your um, community as possible to support that business. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head um, where to send you to buy soils like that, um, but we can follow up with that. Yeah, sorry, I don't have an answer for that. No problem. All right. Um, for the coyote brush, um, Bacaris, I'm going to, I'm going to butcher that name. Coyote brush. How big do they get, Jack? <laughs> right. So this is one of the fun um, parts of our experiment with uh, restoration in an urban setting. They have a genetic potential. That doesn't mean that it's going to get to be that big, but it could be under the perfect circumstances. I've seen them about 15 feet tall at the very biggest. Um, but this one, um, it can stand a lot of abuse. As I said, I've seen these be mowed over every year and they come back. So you could go Edward Scissorhands all over these plants and they'll be perfectly fine as long as you don't dig them out. Uh, typically, they're going to be around seven or eight feet tall if you don't top it. Interesting. Great. Good to know. Um, Someone was curious why the acorns that aren't fertile float. Anyone else want to take that one? Ooh, that's a good question that I don't actually, I mean, I, I have a sneaking suspicion if it has any kind of uh, pest damage, it's because like the weevil ate the inside um, or if it's rotten, it's just like lost matter. Um, but ones without damage, I actually don't know if I should look that up. Any, do you have any ideas, Jack? Brenny, you want to take a guess? Um, yeah, I think what you said, Emily, sounds right. That um, either a weevil has eaten out that uh, meaty, uh, dense matter inside the acorn, or mm -hmm. a pathogen has started eating away at it. Um, and yeah, you're, so your healthy acorns are gonna have that full meaty mass, which is also edible for humans. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's a nut. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that's, they have their full density. There's no holes in there from weevils. And so that's why they're gonna sink. Great. Okay, um, someone asked, will Twan work as a hedge? And I think you said yes, yeah, uh, right, Jack. Edge. 
Um, yeah, <laughs> the things from Australia and East, you know, South America and South America, which are great plants. It's kind of like visiting another country um, from your neighborhood. But this plant is the um, official plant of Los Angeles. It is one of, by the way, everyone you know a Tongva word you can pronounce on because that's the only plant that we still call by its original name. Um, so Toyon is, has a genetic potential to be taller than 20 feet. That would have to be under the right circumstances, but it is a great hedge plant. Um, beautiful white flowers, red berries that are edible. And um, if you want to attract, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, pollinators and wildlife like birds, then that's a wonderful plant. Right. Also, um, I'd like to add on the edibility of the berries, uh, there is a processing, uh, it's recommended that you process the berries first to, um, in order to not have an upset stomach from them. Oh, good to know. We don't want any upset stomachs. <laughs> All right. Um, someone was wondering for the, um, the acorn planting, how far from buildings should you plant them? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I, I know from very for unfortunate experience uh, to not have it right next to a foundation. Um, as for actually how far you can get away with, I know that a lot of street trees I've seen um, with typical, you know, like foot and a half spacing haven't been messing up sidewalks, at least in my experience. Um, as for when it comes to building foundation jacks, I'm sure you would have more specifics, but I feel like if you're like three feet away, at least it's probably not going to be an issue in your lifetime. What would you say, Jack? Say nothing. Let me just lose him. Oh, Jack, no. you're frozen. <laughs> oh, no. All right. We'll, we'll get that answer when he comes back. Cool. All right. Well, I mean, um, I uh, I would start by saying, uh, yeah, don't don't put it right right next to your foundation, please. Um, if you get it a few feet, you're probably going to be okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, probably it. The farther away from your home is is best because you'll also eventually have to consider um, possibly having to cut back the limbs uh, for mm -hmm. fire hazard regulation. Got it. Um, and someone was wondering for the saplings, are there um, places they can plant public locations or woodlands? Um, Ooh, this well, is a Jack question, but I because I was just asking about this. I can start answering that. Um, most of the time you do need a permit to plant um, in any kind of preserve or restoration site. Um, and so if, yeah, if you find maybe like a public, um, like a parkway or a, not a parkway, but um, some kind of like small plot of land within the city, that would be a guerrilla gardening, uh, going rogue type of planting. Um, so maybe not 100% legal, but, um, you know, I won't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Brenna. All right, another good question we got, and we're we're at noon, so I'm going to wrap up pretty soon here. And we can you can email us your questions as, as as well. Someone asked about getting in touch with us via LinkedIn. Just email me your questions, who you want to be in contact with at that Learn at Home with Tree People email, and I will direct you to the right person. Um, we'll also there were a lot of request to get the common names for all the different things that you guys shared so we will send out a little worksheet with the um with both names so that you all have that as well as some other um resources that we have here at tree people on a native plant list and um you know how to actually plant them which we did a few weeks ago so we actually have a video on that as well um another question to wrap up, is it possible to successfully grow native plants and apartment balconies? Yes. Ooh, I Definitely. actually, yeah, we, we, we're doing some experiments on that actually. Um, depending on uh, how big of a plant you're willing to have there. Um, we don't really recommend like bonsaiing any native trees or anything because that breaks our heart. 
but there's a lot of, um, if something likes to live in the undergrowth, meaning it isn't really going to get that big and it's okay with a lot of like full to partial shade, um, those would probably be good candidates. We're trying to have some hummingbird sage as a good like balcony, possibly indoor plant, um, especially because those like to spread laterally, laterally um, so you can easily take cuttings off during the like early spring to then divide out. Um, other ideas like maybe snowberry. Um, there's a lot of annuals that I'm having a perfectly good time with. Like there's some phacelia, which is just perfectly happy on my balcony. Um, Jack, if you have other ideas for a good balcony thing. Absolutely, you covered a lot of good ones. Sorry about my connectivity issues again, but um, we're also looking at heart leaf pensamen, other shade loving, uh, typically oak understory plants that smoke great shade. It makes sense that, you know, those shaded plants can also do well in other areas. So we're actually on that. Um, also, I know that uh, Debs Park Autobahn is working on this as well. Um, they're giving, they're doing a native plant free giveaway um, to people who um, so, to sign up. And one of them are specifically for container plants for people who don't have access to yard. Um, to go back really quick to that question about how far to plant an oak from the tree or from the house, um, if you can see behind me that coast live oak there. It's about 15 feet away from my neighbor's shed, which is right about here-ish. Um, you just want to make sure not to sit under power lines because it may not happen during our lifetime, but it's going to be pretty tall tree and that's not a good combination. Also, just be aware where your, um, your plumbing is and things like that. I've seen a, co a mature coast live oak within five feet of a house in my neighborhood. I wouldn't have planted it that close, but... 15, 20, 10, 15 feet should be fine as long as you print it up as needed. Right. Okay, guys. So um, I think we should wrap up. So the last thing I wanted to say is we did promise that we would send out a seed packet to all those that came on to our presentation today. So I've sent out the link to a form if you would like to sign up and get that free seed packet sent directly to your door. Um, these are seeds that Jack collected and others um, in our tree people family, and we put them all together in their little seed bombs that you can spread. Um, so go ahead and sign up on that form if you want um, those seed packets delivered to you. Again, if you have any other questions, I know there are other questions, but we have to wrap up. Just shoot an email to learn at home with tree people at treepeople.org, and I will direct um, your question to Emily, Jack, and Brenna. Um, and then we would love you to send pictures of your native plants that you're growing, any seeds you're collecting, little baby acorn seeds. Um, just shoot us um, videos, photos via social media and tag at tree people underscore org or hashtag green quarantine so we can share you guys out there taking care of your native plants. Um, and finally, um, it's just been really great to have all of you. And if you'd like to support Learn at Home, you can go to our donate website and donate. All proceeds will go to, you know, really supporting this programming that we're offering virtually right now. So I'm seeing just so you, because I know, Brenna, you can't see the chat. I'm seeing a lot of thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you guys for coming on. We're really grateful. And uh, see you next week for Urban Heat. Bye. Thank you. Virtual Bye. hug. Yes, Bye. virtual hug with the helicopter going. <laughs> and also, California Native Plant Society, um, Theodore Payne, uh, Artemisia Collective, LA River, Friends of LA River. There's so many people working on these things. So uh, support people, but also, you know, there's a lot of resources out there to, to help your mission. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye, everybody. I'm gonna let everybody hop off. Great job, guys. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> nice work yeah. all. Sorry about that weird um when I had to 
unshare the slideshow. Oh, no, that was my I, fault because I should I have known that by muting you that would happen. And that was my fault. I put you in a tough spot. Um, I just, I heard background noise at a certain point. So I had to. Yeah. <laughs> that, a lot over here. <laughs> yeah, because that, was, that was awesome. And lots of questions, like the most questions we've ever mm -hmm. got. So, yeah, it's a nice yeah. engaged audience. Yeah. That for means sure. that you guys did a great job because people are hungry for answers. <laughs> I, I feel kind of like I, I knew this question was coming up and I didn't have an answer for it. And uh, I'm sure they're going to email us about it. Um, there's at least one person who like has potted trees and really wants to get rid of them. And I know they're like, can they come to the nursery? And our answer is going to be like, no, we already have too many oaks in the nursery. Um, and then also being like, where can we plant these? And like, I still don't have a good answer. And I know that there's going to be people who like have all these trees and they're like, okay, where yeah. do we go? Emily, it's, so, it's uh... been tree people's issue since the very beginning days. People used to literally drive up and, and just drop trees off outside the nursery. Oh, assuming, no. oh and at Christmas time was the worst. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. So Yeah, we had a person ask me about that. Yeah. I I need like if we ever had the funds or anything, like if we just had a oh what's that? You grew trees at home and you want to put them somewhere, here they go. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's like, yeah. oh it's so stressful. <laughs> People have to learn to uh commit if they're if they're gonna do that, you know. But uh yeah, I don't know yeah. what the answer is because yeah, I'm just gonna end up composted. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, good. well, it's good to know that it's an issue, and maybe we can, I don't know, there's, brainstorm ways. Yeah, there's like, if we ever can figure out some like way to use this resource of a whole bunch of people trying to get rid of their trees. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. it's been forever. Yeah, but, yeah. Did we lose Jack? He's yeah, muted. I can see him, but and we just head heard. out. Great we job, really, really great job. There's mm -hmm. still yeah. a couple um, members of the public that are on the video. Oh, just no, I, I got them all off. That's okay. just tree people. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Is it Bella yeah. and Maria? Or yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They're <laughs> all good. Our, our secret members. They were making sure that uh, you know. No one did anything bad. <laughs> well, they did a good All job. Right. I'll talk to you later. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Thanks for having us. Thank you.